Emily, don't worry. I think I'm close. I'm gonna set everything right. Just be careful. Alone in the Dark has had it rough over the last two decades. It simply cannot be denied. It's had revival after revival, with nothing really coming from those attempts other than some fan contention and sometimes some downright disgust. However, for its 1992 iteration that was so genre defining and boundary pushing, we now have a direct remake of that game that birthed horror itself. Well, survival horror. Its Lovecraftian themes are stronger than ever here, and it's the best representation of that genre, hands down. Sorry, Sinking City. THQ and Pieces Interactive have created just the right spark to reignite the franchise with the latest remake, filling that double-A horror gap that rarely scratches the correct itch for fans clambering for it. We have a plethora of indie games on offer in the spooky genre, and on the other end of the scale we have the likes of Alan Wake 2 and Resident Evil 4 Remake, which were both fantastic but AAA products. So there was never anything really filling that middle ground, until now. Alone in the Dark is more of a psychological haunted house simulator, split between complex puzzles and more than serviceable combat. Luckily it has two very strong actors, displaying their talents moment by moment in intriguing cutscenes and plot moments. David Arbour and Jodie Comer have done a fantastic job at playing Edward and Emily in this iteration. They play off each other well, and each version of the game, depending on who you play as, has varied dialogue, cutscenes, and specific moments making it a core amount of replay value there. Their performances are great here and they really add to the star power and emotional connection of the characters. They've definitely helped sell the game, let's be honest. It really offers an enthralling, slow-paced tale of woe and wonder with a substantial amount of lore attached to it, which I did not expect but welcomed. One point I do want to touch on and bring up in this game review analysis, whatever you want to call it, is the mixed reviews. Because it's really frustrating to see modern gaming journalism outlets jump on this game expecting some sort of quadruple A survival horror akin to Resident Evil 4 or any of the other remakes. But it never advertised itself as that. It was never marketed in that way and they didn't keep their expectations in check for what, you know, Alone in the Dark's message, themes and budget and plot account for. It's different inherently, it's slow, it's methodical, supernatural, and it's all about that dark spectacle. With themes of mental health, spiralling depression and anxiety, it has a lot going on in its narrative, even if it may get a bit confusing, silly or complex. Even with that more straightforward introduction at the start of the game, I still think it works quite well. Personally, as someone who studied journalism at uni and have seen how rushed the reviewing process can be going from game to game to game, I have a good theory on why this game is getting mid reviews. At least, you know, it was at launch. It's getting some better ones now. And that's places like IGN, but not everyone. In short, they barely played it and rushed through what they did. Trust creators, guys. Trust your friends. Trust your own views. Form your own opinions. This game is great, it's old school and different, but it's great. And once you get past those first few hours, which are good anyway, you see how it expands and clearly, these reviewers did not do that. They rushed through it or they didn't like it, they went into this trying to hate on it already. Its core gameplay loop will have you exploring Deceto Manor, a bizarre mental health institution set in New Orleans, Louisiana style in the 1920s. The drive is Emily trying to find her uncle, who is known for having mental episodes or of melancholy and dread, and it seems to run in the family from what Emily says, with Edward, her PI, tagging along to help as well. 
Picking either of these establishes your story and drive and then it simply begins. So there is a character select, much like Resident Evil 2, but it's done way better here. You actually interact and see each other a lot more. You can make the game give you endless hints as well. There's loads of accessibility and difficulty options. There's a multitude of options there to add extra layers of brain scratching annoyance to your playthrough if you want to go in totally blind or if you're the kind of person who just wants to play through and likes the hints because you struggle but you love these games, go for it. Or if you may be a disabled gamer in any sense of the word, there is some help there. Each room is also wholly unique within Deceto designed meticulously with care and a photorealistic style. Puzzles strewn around that you can simply see a locked door and you think, oh, how do I get to that? Or a broken boiler that needs fixing, oh, how do I fix that? Panels of a clock that need putting together or complex multi-stages, including paintings that need flipping around to see rot, books and locks that kind of halt your progress, but in a fun way. And between all these plot moments and the puzzles and exploring as well, it really fleshes the game out. The puzzles themselves are some of the strongest elements of the game, all linked to Jeremy's book you pick up at the start. Emily's uncle, you are trying to find, has left you some clues. This journal is an interactable object in your inventory, and while this is not inventory management per se, it definitely expects you to use your inventory. And it helps you visually with clues to every story progression puzzle in the game so far I have seen, either vaguely or very on the nose. The rest is up to you, you need to find the clues to help you progress. You'll come across dark fiends as well, ghouls and goblins trying to end your path. Fighting with melee weapons you find all around that you know, vary in how long they last from like an axe, like a pipe and then you have things more so like sledgehammers. You also have your trusty pistol and a shotgun, but there is contextual throwable items to assist you along the way. There was this interesting moment where I, la I led a ghoul around a car just throwing bricks at it, <laughs> and yeah, they're not the smartest in the world, but the AI can try and actually head you off, so it's not the AI being silly, it's just me messing around with the game. Now, while this is completely serviceable or okay for this league of game it's in, the AA market, it does feel lacking in comparison to most modern horror games and the smoothness they offer. But it, it's no way clunky, I would say. It's more so rigid and it won't be for everyone. There's definitely a kind of dance to it, it's the combat. There's a certain way to go about it, a bit like Callisto Protocol, but unfortunately, that had a horrible dodge mechanic we won't go into. This doesn't. This has a nice dodge mechanic. <laughs> and that's one up over Resident Evil 2 already. I still don't understand why that game did not have a dodge mechanic. But anyway, a good comparison would be Evil Within. A great game with a unique vibe and combat style that you probably don't remember a lot of, but the camera was quite up close and the shooting was quite rigid. One thing that Resident Evil 4 Remake showcased was its amazingly fluid and exciting combat, something I think Alone in the Dark could have benefited from, but I understand they were going in a different direction. Alone in the Dark is far more about its story, characters, world building, lore, the puzzles. The combat is an obstacle at times to overcome, but it also feels like maybe a bit of an afterthought at times. The atmosphere is what will sell this game at the end of the day, and if you're a horror fan, a Lovecraft fan, just any of that Cthulhu stuff, nothing quite feels like this game does, and it has a unique soul to it. The music is like a sombre jazz with a shrieking ambience of the swampland mixed with the sunset light pouring through the wood panel windows that look a bit dilapidated and dusty. It's just an eerie end of summer before the darkness approaches vibe. It's very odd to explain, I cannot quite find the words to describe it. And what this game's environment and lighting offer, I really like it though. It's melancholic in every turn you take around its doors, rooms and hidden secrets. Probably Lovecraftian lighting is a term I would like to coin at this point. 
The best moments come from the wild, wacky and dark, infested dreams of Jeremy that you do enter. When you locate a dream location within Dossetto via the talisman you got at the start of the game, you will venture back to that room, corridor or basement and see the world open and shift into a brand new location. No loading screens, just new and fascinating areas to stumble into. This is when it clicked for me that the manor itself is a hub space. That is the world menu of sorts to take you to various locations. But it's also a character in its own right. And within these memories, you're basically losing your mind within a man, losing their, you know, their mind and you're chasing him at the same time. You know, wheels, gears within everything. It's just, it's just hard to explain what is going on until you play it. The game, as I said, has a lot of good bones. It has room to do a lot more with either DLC or a sequel. But if this is all we get, Alone in the Dark Remake is as good as it gets for a short time. It's not the longest game in the world. Between its striking visual style, the intriguing plot and the supernatural threats and goddamn fantastic atmosphere, Alone in the Dark is said to be another cult classic that will divide gamers to a point. It's evident in the reviews, it won't be for everyone, and some people will not have the patience for, for it. But it's certainly not a bad game. It's a positive step in the right direction for the franchise, and it's ignited the interest from people just enough. What this game needs is a direct sequel though, to expand upon everything present here, the combat, the controls and the world can all easily be improved, let's be honest. It's a 7 to an 8 if I was going to give it a score, essentially. And I think a grander scale and a bigger budget would entice a broader fan base. But if they want to keep it niche, there's still things they could do to keep it in that AA market. Nevertheless, this game is worth your time as a horror fan, whether you love the original or one of its reboots or you've never heard of it before. The primary antagonist though, we have not touched on during this video for a reason. Just sit back and uncover the secrets of the Dark Man. It's well worth your time. And also, there is direct inspiration from many games that play here, as I've mentioned, but it feels unique enough to appeal to horror fans and people into dark mysteries or investigatory games like Sherlock Holmes or L.A. Noir. It's just a shame that Alone in the Dark Street borrows so much from other games and doesn't fully embrace its ambitious genre-defining roots like the 1992 version really pushed with boundaries. Well, certainly it's not clicked into my brain like Alan Wake 2, and I, I wouldn't expect it to be, they're different leagues. It does not detract from what THQ and pieces have worked on here. This is a perfect middle ground game that has fantastic points and good bones to build on. I'm just glad we finally have it in our hands and are able to enjoy it and I intend to platinum it. We've waited long enough, and while it won't rival the greats, it directly inspired in any major sense, it's on its own new path of redemption to be the most tantalisingly dark and gorgeous horror jaunt of 2024 yet. Let's hope this is a reignition of the series we all need. So yeah, that is kind of my roundup and thoughts of Alone in the Dark's remake. Um, I did want to do a deeper dive video essay on this, but unfortunately it just didn't quite tickle that itch or intrigue for me to go full into that. So I thought more of like a rambly impressions would be more suitable to let you guys know, you know, is this worth it? You know, a horror fan, what are they thinking of it? And there's been a lot of mixed reviews on this, like I've said, so... I thought it was well worth covering for the channel and suits as well, so I will probably cover it in future in some sense. Um, we'll have a probably deeper think on this and come back to it. We'll see. And we'll definitely will stream it on the Twitch. So if you're following over there, you'll probably see that soon. But yeah, thank you for all the support, guys. We're nearing 300 subs. We may have passed it by the time this video goes up, but thank you. Just thank you. The channel's doing amazing, and I really appreciate it. Hope you have a good day, guys, and I'll see you soon. Bye bye. The Dark Man. Who is he? No, 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 don't say his name. He can hear us. He's always listening. Jeremy. 
I need to understand what is going on. I promised him everything. When the sun rises, I will be chained in his sunken desert temple for an eternity. Why would you give me hope? That's so cruel. Okay. Sounds like we're onto something here. What should Look I- Look out! Behind you! Run! Don't let him take you!